So this is our first Literacy Lakotla, which we are hosting at Fundawane, and we're really excited to have you all here, and that everyone could make it. Um, some, I think I'm going to give a very short introduction or an overview of uh, why we're here. I've put down five, four different questions that we're going to, I want to chat about very briefly, just for 20 to 30 minutes before we hand over to um, Catherine Snow and Pamela Mason, who will be doing the keynote addresses. Uh, so the first one is to just say, uh, to talk about what are we doing here today? What's the goal? What's the aim? Uh, the second one is to talk about uh, a framework or a, 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 what I'm calling a mnemonic, the five T's of reading. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a familiar thing. If Catherine is squinting to look at it, you know, it's probably not, it's probably not familiar. Talking briefly about reading comprehension in South Africa. And then lastly, uh, the organization that's hosting this, um, the Funda Wande, um, which I'm part of, to give some background, very short background to that. Um, so it might seem like a strange thing to, to start a discussion about um, uh, a literacy, Lakotla, and early grade reading. This is Naomi Klein. Uh, she's an activist that's based in Canada. But to talk about why, why are we talking about the Keystone Pipeline in Canada and the US? Um, and the, this was actually the inspiration behind the Lechotla. Uh, she had this quote where she says, um, she was talking about the resistance that they faced from the big oil companies when they were trying to roll out this pipeline and activists were, were trying to stop it. Um, and one of the things that she said, uh, which I think was very, um, was influential for me, is saying that, and I'll, I'll read it out here, if everyone in the room is always agreeing, your coalition probably isn't big enough. And I think that there are a lot of people that have different perspectives in this room, but I can be quite clear, I'm sure, that there are some issues at least that we don't agree on. <laughs> um, there might be some things that we do agree on, and that's very positive, and we want to foreground those things today. But the aim is also to say that there are these different stakeholders that have different perspectives um, about what we should be doing. Um, and that unless we've got all those people in the room, we're unlikely to get a solution that particularly the government uh, would be able to take up. Um, so firstly, the, the five T's model, this was something that I, when I was trying to figure out for another a, a book that I was helping to edit, to think about early grade reading, uh, I, there were five T's that came up. And I find it easy if they, if they all start with the same letter. <laughs> so the first one is teaching. And I've included the big five here. Many of you will be familiar with this. For those that were at the PhD workshop yesterday, we discussed these big five, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Um, from the National Re Reading Panel, which Catherine Snow was, uh, played an imminent role in, in kind of establishing, writing up, synthesizing that report. Uh, the second T is training, both in-service and pre-service training. The third T is texts both the quantity and quality of texts. Uh, the fourth T is tests, formative and summative tests. And then the last one is tongue, uh, the language that we are actually using when we're teaching children to read. And it's not meant to be exhaustive, but it is meant to be this helpful heuristic. And you'll see on the sides here, I've included the context, the socioeconomic and cultural and linguistic context, as well as the minimum conditions for learning. And I think this is a helpful, uh, a helpful thing to look at. Questions that come up as a result of this. What should we teach children and how should we teach it? What training do we need to give pre-service and in-service teachers to equip them to teach reading for meaning? When and how should children be assessed? And importantly, what should those results be used for? What resources and texts do teachers need in order to teach reading for meaning? And critically, what languages should children be taught in when should they be introduced? How should they be introduced? And how long should they be taught in those languages? Uh, additional questions around context. How can we address each of these five questions, which I think we would all agree on are ones that need to be addressed, but do so in ways that are socio-culturally relevant and also fiscally possible? Uh, not just thinking in the abstract, but how could we actually change this in the near term? And then lastly, defining what are the minimum conditions for learning and how do we ensure that they are met? that are both realistic, but also non-negotiable. So not just saying in the policy document that class sizes should be capped at 35, that doesn't happen. Whereas if we said no class can exceed 50, it's possible that that may happen. 
So I wanted to give some stats around each of these. The first one, teaching and training. Some of the colleagues here from uh, the SERP uh, group that have done a lot of work on this recently. They did a report from 12 higher education institutions. And one of the things that they found was that none of these HEIs refer to the big five uh, in the teaching of reading. Uh, they say this survey reveals only a few of the HEIs focus specifically on language literacy and even fewer on teaching reading with comprehension. Similarly, only a few HEIs teach learning to read. The focus is rather on honing already existing literacy skills or reading skills or on advanced reading skills. A number have included some of the components, uh, none of them have included all of them. If we look at texts, uh, a recent study that was funded by uh, the DG Murray Trust found, uh, the, and the South African Book Council, found that 58% of adult South Africans 16 years and older have no printed books in their home. Only 7% of adult South Africans have more than 10 <laughs> printed books in their home. And lastly, that 93% of adult South Africans, if we put those two together, uh, have less than 11 printed books in their home. If we look at the school, the school monitoring survey showed that 61% of primary schools have access to a central or a mobile library. Big differences between poor and wealthy schools. But the NEMS database that the department has mentioned and released shows that only 30% of schools have libraries, and when they looked if they were stocked, only 17% of those schools had, had stocked libraries. So access to text is a clear uh, problem. The second one is tongue. I think everyone, at least in this room, is, is in agreement that children need to learn to read in a language that they speak and understand. Uh, there's contention about where that is the case. I'm not going to go into detail about this. But basically, as again, a helpful stat, in 70% of foundation phase uh, having schools, schools that are primary schools, 70% of primary schools, at least 70% of kids speak the same language. Gauteng is a massive outlier here. Gauteng is the exception, it's not the rule. Teaching in mother tongue and teaching in a single mother tongue in a school is possible in the majority of schools outside of these extremely urban contexts, but the stats um, are up here. On tests, South Africa is quite unique. Internationally, there's a, a big backlash against testing uh, and the over-testing, particularly in the US. I think we look uh, at the US and say that's probably what not to do in terms of testing. Uh, but there's currently no sta standardized national exam in South Africa before the school leaving exam. Um, this is different to the rest of our neighbors. All of our neighbors have primary, at least one primary school exam. And it's also different to developing countries in general. In 70% of uh, these developing countries that UNESCO looked at, there was at least one primary school exam. Very briefly, I did want to touch on comprehension. I think we all acknowledge this is the holy grail of uh, of reading. Uh, even though it's listed as one of these additional things, basically all of these things, the reason why we care about them is because they lead to comprehension. This is the reason why we are reading. It's very difficult to read for meaning or for pleasure if you don't understand what's going on. Um, so the, we are fortunate in South Africa and some of the people that are in the room are instrumental in conducting the Pearls Assessment, uh, which was done in 2006, in 2011, and 2016. An unknown fact in South Africa is that there was actually a very large improvement in reading outcomes from 2006 to 2011, but then no improvement from 2011 to 2016. It's difficult to interpret these scores intuitively, so we look at the Pearls benchmarks, and I think this figure, which is now familiar, that 78% of South African grade four learners cannot read for meaning in any language. I know there are people in the room that uh, have called into question the validity of pearls, that there are translation issues and various other things, but I think even if that number was 20 percentage points lower, it's still far too high. So even if this number was much lower than that, I think if it was more than half, which most of us would probably agree, that fifth, more than 50% of African home language children do not acquire reading literacy in the foundation phase, that's far too high. Internationally, and this is actually, uh, although it's the international median, uh, this country, it's also the US, when 78% of our grade four kids cannot read for meaning, only 4% of the rest of the countries that participated in Pearls could not reach that benchmark. These are the stats for America as well, 4%. 96% of American kids will reach the low international benchmark. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, we also know that this is uh, radically different based on which country you're in. So in Finland, all of us would look to that system as being a desirable one for multiple reasons. 
uh, not just because of high outcomes, but also how they get those high outcomes. Um, interestingly, Finland does have a, a primary school assessment. It's a sample-based one. It's used for monitoring trends over time. 98% of kids would reach that benchmark. In England, 97% of kids would reach that benchmark. In the US, 96%. So when we hear people in the UK and the US say, we also have a reading crisis, we say, OK. You know, it's a slightly different context, but OK. But then a whole lot of other developing countries as well that participate in these assessments. Um, and you can see that countries that are either equally as wealthy or poor as South Africa <laughs> perform much, much better than we do. So where only 22% of South African grade four kids can read for meaning, uh, in Iran, this is 65%. Iran has the same GDP per capita as South Africa. Uh, there are a lot of neighboring countries that have better results when we look at the SACMEC tests, for example. Um, this is even, the, even these kinds of things are saying, what does it mean when someone can't reach a low international benchmark? It's difficult to understand viscerally. So I've given a text. Some of you would have seen this text uh, and this uh, presentation part before. But this is a text that Nidu, uh, the National Education Evaluation Development Unit, uh, which Nick Taylor, who's here, was heading up at the time, where they focused on reading. Uh, and they went and surveyed, in this case, 200 plus rural schools. So it was only rural schools. Uh, and they tested them at the grade five level, and this was in English. This was the text that they asked them to read aloud, and the aim was to look at how, how quickly they could read, oral reading fluency as well as the oral comprehension of the text. I'm just gonna show you the first two sentences of this text. Uh, many years ago, Leopard was a creature with no spots, and I wanna show you two different um, children that are reading this text. The first child is the one that's reading at the recommended rate. Uh, at grade five, and English is the lolt, which is why this was, uh, the test was done in English. Uh, it's important to note that this is the same in African languages. We could show you an African language text, and I think there's a lot of work that's been done to show that reading rates are, are not where they need to be in African languages either. So although this is in English, we do see the same results uh, in African languages. The second reader is what 40% of South African rural grade five learners read at, uh, and that's uh, at 40 words correct per minute, but also lower, and this is at the grade five level. So I'm just gonna show you um, two sentences. Let's just watch it uh, and, and think about it. Don't talk to your neighbor or ask questions uh, or, or any of those things. Okay, so both children have just started reading. So the first learners finish reading. And now the second readers finished reading. I think all of us look at that and say this is heartbreaking, that that's some, that's some children's experience when they go to school. Their textbooks look like that. If they have storybooks, that's how they're experiencing those storybooks. Um, and if this is their engagement with text, it's impossible that they will understand what they're reading. It's also impossible that they will be able to enjoy reading themselves. There are various different forces for change where we can say, OK, <clears throat> this is totally unacceptable. How do we do something about this? We could change government policy. We could try and change law uh, and litigation. There's discussions at the moment about introducing a right to read. We could change, try and change professional norms, knowledge, and ideology and offer teachers uh, meaningful training opportunities. Some people would say the entire school system is broken and that we should introduce market forces of demand and supply. The state is failing. Other people would say we need to mobilize, whether that's politically or teacher unions uh, or social organizations like Equal Education. Uh, and lastly, the, the other interventions around philanthropy and volunteerism or introducing interventions that will hopefully then influence what the state ends up doing. I think each one of us could probably identify ourselves in one of those different boxes and say, we really think that this is the lever for change. Government policy is the lever for change. The law and strategic litigation is actually how we're going to get this done, etc. But in the spirit of what I said earlier about the coalition needing to be big enough that we can actually take on this problem, we need to recognize that every single one of those uh, plays an important role. And that unless all of those people are around the table and can commonly agree on some kind of shared minimum of what we need to be doing going forward, we're likely to have similar conversations in 10 years' time. And the aim of bringing these people together now 
uh, and these types of uh, meetings happening annually is to try and say, are we going to move forward? In 10 years' time, when we look back, will we be able to say there are instances where we used to have kids did not have access to high-quality non-fiction texts in their home language? That's changed. Tick. We've done that. We've engaged with that particular issue. Class sizes were extreme. We've now addressed that, and, and so on. The last thing that I want to mention uh, very briefly is um, this past over here, philanthropy interventions and volunteerism. Um, for the last, uh, since 2017, so for the last two years, um, I've been working together with uh, a lot of other literacy um, and education researchers, academics, um, coaches, different people, government uh, in the Eastern Cape Department of Education, and we're going to hear different instances about this. But this is one example of many um, that we'll, we will hear of today of people that are working in the education space. Um, we've hosted this literacy lechotla uh, partly to make people aware of this, the resources that we've created that are all open access, but also so that other people can say these are the areas that we work in, this is how we see the system and how we think it should change. Very briefly, our, the four areas that we focus on are training, teacher training, materials development, uh, relationships and advocacy uh, and PR as well as research. We think that unless you address each of these four issues, it's very unlikely that we will eventually get to ensuring all children learn to read for meaning in their home language. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this. I think in your packs there's an overview of the activities that we've been working on. There are lots of different things. Um, the one thing that I would uh, like to do just very briefly is if anyone is of the people that are here, and there are quite a lot, uh, are doing are part of this Fundawane team. You can probably see their pictures here, although they might not look like their pictures. <laughs> Some people spruce themselves up a lot, and I'm like, oh, who is this person? Um, is if everyone that's involved with Fundawane can just stand at the moment, now, uh, just so that people can see these are people that it's worth, if, if you've got questions, it's not like I'm going to be able to say these are all of the different people, but these are people that are worth speaking to and saying, oh, I wanted to find out more about this, how does this work, uh, etc. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to do before we hand over to uh, Catherine and to Pamela is just to show a very short video. Um, I did deliberately choose not to embed this because all of our videos are on YouTube. So I think that gives an overview of where we're coming from, the, what we're trying to do with the program that we have. I think that there is much more information uh, that's on the, uh, in your pack in the annual report. <laughs>